Good morning, everyone. We are live. God is here. Amen. Hallelujah. Do you want to worship him this morning? I know I do. Let's just worship him the praise this morning. Hallelujah. We worship you, God. We're so thankful to be here, God. Hallelujah. Give you all the praise, Lord. It's a happy day, Lord. The greatest day in history. Devastating, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. Yes, he is. The empty cross, the empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive. And oh, happy day, happy day. Wash my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same. Sing like never before 
your name, your name is great, and your heart is kind, for all your goodness, I will keep on singing, yeah, 10,000 reasons for my heart to find, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, we'll worship, worship His soul. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Because we do serve a loving God. And he's worthy of praise. It says, for all your goodness I will keep on singing. 10,000 reasons for my heart to find. Let's sing that together one more time. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on. Father God, we lift up the name of Jesus this morning, for there is no other name like the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. Purchase of God, born of His Spirit, oh, washed in His blood. Yes, this is my story, and yeah, this is my song. I'm praising, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture, the burst on my side, angels, angels descending, break from above, echoes of her, oh, whispers 
and for your love, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to me. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. You became sin. You were no sin. We might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. He became, he became sin. We knew no sin. That we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself. so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Messiah, he 
ourselves from seeing the Lord because he's been there all the time and it's us who needs to open our are we that need to open our eyes to be able to see and hear the Lord but no matter what God is always there he's always there and he's always faithful and he's always true and you could say well no he hasn't been the fact that we get out of bed every morning shows that God is faithful and true. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to your name. Glory to the name of Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. You are holy and true. Glory to your name, Jesus. God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many brought your Bibles this morning? Hold them up. Keep them held up. Heavenly Father, your, your word, you're here today. You're here today. I believe, Lord, we're entering a time of manifestation of miracles. I believe there's going to be manifestations of angels. And we don't glorify angels, but they're ministering angels. And Lord, you see these Bibles this morning. And Father, that's your word. You see your word, and you want your word to manifest within the people of God. And Lord, I pray as this song goes to open our eyes, open our ears to receive what is in that book. The book, we don't worship that book. We worship you, the word. We thank you for the word. And Lord, put in the hearts of the people here to realize that if they desire to see you, we need to come before you and to praise you. We need to worship you, Lord. We need to come to you thanking you in advance for the need that we have in our life. We need to come with expectation through that word. So, Lord, anoint that word this morning in a supernatural way. And everyone in here, Lord, that has a need of healing within their body, needs strength, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, whatever it is, financially, Lord, that there will be a manifestation of your Holy Spirit power on the lives of your people this morning. 
But Lord, you see the word. You see your word as we hold them up before you. And Lord, that word is to be planted within our hearts. And so Lord, right now, we submit this time to you. We submit it to you. And Lord, we're going to sing this song one more time because it glorifies you. And Lord, let the people get involved that hadn't been involved the first time and get involved right now if they desire truly, truly, if you desire to sense the power and presence and God in your life, you need to get involved with this, that we all come in unity of faith, worshiping our Heavenly Father. For there's many of you who are sitting here this morning who have great need. And the one who has the power to meet that need desires to hear your praises. Even if it's a sacrifice, praise him. He's here. Amy, let's sing that again. service this morning, Lord God. Let your anointing flow and move in the hearts and the lives of each person here, Lord. And we pray that you would anoint Pastor Lynn as he gets up to preach the message of your word this morning, Lord. May our hearts be challenged and encouraged, Lord Jesus, as we hear the word. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, please greet one another before you're seated.
Good morning, Crossfire Assembly. Morning, Mark. Just want to welcome everyone this morning. I want to also welcome all of those who are joining us on Facebook. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, so please help me in um, welcoming all our guests today and everyone on, joining us on Facebook. And Fred has information on the church. He also has prayer cards in there. So if you're in need of any of those, please raise your hand. And Fred will be happy to hand you one. And we have a prayer box, a wooden box at the bottom of the steps uh, that you can put your prayer request cards in. I want to start out by um, officially welcoming Brother Mark to the announcement team. Yeah. We're really glad to have him join. And... You know, this is about obedience, and we really appreciate his obedience in doing this. Um, and he did a really good job, a great job, his first time. Uh, in fact, uh, it was flawless. And I even told him ahead of time, Brian and I have a system where we allow ourselves no more than 10 mistakes each time. <laughs> Unless there's more than 10 announcements, then we have to, of course, raise that. But So... I'm looking at Mark, and you know he's now, I would say, the steady one. And then uh, two weeks ago, when Brother Brian coined it the Sunday of love, he, he's, he's now the funny one. So I'm happy to take my new title as number three. Uh, Proverbs 9.10 tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And, you know, we are to fear God um, unless, or, or, yes, we are to fear God, but it is all about, um, you know, the beginning of wisdom. And, um, in King, like in Kings, it says, um, And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the way of the Father, in his sin, wherewith he made Israel sin. And, um, you know, if you're, God doesn't want us to live in fear, but if we're obeying him and we love him, we, we don't have to live in fear. Amen. In fact, uh, we are to be fearless. Amen. And unless you're doing evil in the sight of the Lord, uh, those are the people that really should be fearing God. <clears throat> uh, in fact, knowing that we have his Holy Spirit to comfort us under God's protection. Uh, but fear is a human reaction. Uh, when traumatic events happen in our lives, fear is one of the most common things that enters in first. And from the world's standpoint, there's almost an endless number of fears right now to have that people would have, right? Yeah. But if you're a blood-bought, born-again follower of Jesus, we only have to have one fear, and that's the fear of the Lord, right? Yeah. Um, and God doesn't want us to be afraid, right? And he knows that we're a fearful people. Look at all the times when he sends an angel as a messenger. What's the first thing the angel says? Fear not. fear not, exactly. In fact, fear not appears in the Bible around 80 times. Isaiah 41.10, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea. I will help thee, yea. I will hold up, uphold thee in the right hand of my righteousness. In 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made in perfect love. Psalm 27.1, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Um, you know, I mentioned the Holy Spirit, and it's, it's always amazing to me how the Holy Spirit really has a presence in our church, in our fam church family, and we see signs of it. We talk about that uh, quite often, and a really good example of that is, you know, I, I've told you before, sometimes when I'm preparing something for announcements like this, sometimes um, 
you know, it comes in, uh, you know, I, I get the message early. Uh, it kind of varies. Sometimes, um, one time it was changed on Sunday morning. Uh, so that's fine. Uh, but this message actually started uh, three weeks ago during Pastor Lynn's sermon. And I just felt the Holy Spirit was telling me, you know, fear not, fear not. And um, so as I did research uh, th- th- uh, throughout the last three weeks, uh, you know, God presented scriptures to me. And what was kind of interesting is last uh, Sunday, one of Pastor Lynn's um, scriptures that he used was in Hebrews. And when I turned to that page, there was a scripture that was circled in my Bible. Now, this is interesting because I don't circle scriptures in my Bible. <laughs> but my wife, Darla, when she borrows my Bible, will circle scriptures in my Bible. <laughs> so, as, he, as Pastor Lynn was speaking, you know, I, I noticed the circle. Actually, it's a square. Um, and it's Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Now, that's not the end of the story. Um, It's kind of interesting. So I remembered it from Sunday. So early in the week, I grabbed my Bible, and I wanted to look it up and mark it, the page and everything, and prepare. So Darla's like, what are you doing? I go, oh, this. So I told her the whole thing, and I read her the scripture, and she goes, oh, that's really cool. And then she didn't really think much more about it. Well, yesterday, um, she found out she was going to be giving the lesson at youth group last night. So she did some research, and she found a lesson. And she's sitting in the chair, and she's looking looking it over. And she goes, huh, there's a scripture here from Hebrews. She goes, what was the one that, remember on Tuesday when you said, what was that scripture? So I told her, she goes, this is the scripture that's right here in my page. Yeah. So it's just amazing how the Holy Spirit... Works that way. I need Mark up here to organize for me. So please silence your cell phones as to not to distract anyone uh, during the service. We appreciate that. Uh, please join us tonight for online Sunday prayer at 6 p.m. Uh, Diana, Mon- see my, Diana Monsoor with questions. Uh, March Bible study starts this Wednesday at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Please see J.J. Sanyembo with questions. The annual church business meeting will be after the morning service on Sunday, March 14th. Members are encouraged to attend. Uh, church directory monthly newsletter slash prayer email, in uh, parentheses, Amy, is going to uh, come up and speak. Segway there, Rick. I appreciate that. <laughs> Remember, um, I do what I told. I know. You did very well there. Very well. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, so I just wanted to briefly just mention a few things. So you probably got the monthly newsletter. For those of you who we have your email, in there you saw that we are going to be rolling out an online church directory. And I'm really excited about it. It's something that I've been wanting to do for a while. And I've had a few people say, hey, we would really like contact information to be able to reach out to people in the church. One of the things in the world that we live in, we don't like pieces of paper flying around with people's information on it anymore. So the great thing is, is we now have a tool for an online church directory. So what is going to happen over the course of the next few weeks this month is you'll be getting uh, an email with an invitation where you can log in. Um, You set up your own password, so it's all confidential. You'll be able to in there um, see your address. You can look up other contact information for people in the church, which is really great. Uh, And then also on there, you can keep track of your your giving throughout the year, and you can print out things. That's only visible to you, though, so it's kind of like your own personal account to just kind of see what you um, have with your online giving for the year too. So this is a a great tool. I I just think it's exciting because in that way, if you want someone's number, 
you can reach out and, and go in there and find it. Um, if you do need changes made to your address or contact information, please send um, an email to info at cfassembly.com and we'll make sure that that information gets updated. Uh, so if something's not right, please let us know. If you currently aren't on our email list, but you want to be able to be part of the directory, again, email us at info at cfassembly.com. And then also our monthly newsletter. I, I, unless I get people's email addresses, I'm not able to send it out. So if you want to be on that email list, again, please send it to info at cfassembly.com and we'll get you added to that list. And then also we have a prayer email list as well too because prayer is, a, is an important tool and key at our church that we want to be able to uplift people in prayer for our needs. It goes to a team of people throughout the church to be able to continue to pray, not just at Sunday night. If you're not on that and you want to be on it again go to perfect so because uh, we do send out regular requests on there as well too and if you have a need feel free to do prayer at cfassembly.com so that we can pray for you as well too so if you have any questions from that please feel free to come and see me after the service today thanks everyone thank you amy Uh, we have what is uh, described on here as a big happy birthday to Sister Nan. Yay! Happy birthday, Nan. Sing. Oh, whoa, that was enough. It was off for a second here. Let's go and sing to Nan. Nan, stand up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Nan. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Nan. We love you. Happy birthday, Nan. Uh, before, we, um, before we give the offering, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about last night. Uh, we had a Crossfire Youth Group meeting. Yes. The Ignite Group met. Yes. And what's kind of cool is uh, Darla's... They, we, well, back up a little bit. So they're... What, what they did last night was they had a cupcake competition, a baking competition. And they actually mixed up the batter, made the cupcakes, baked them, oh. decorated them, and they had to have a theme, and they had, it was just really, really cool. And the youth really gets in, they just love this. They just love doing these things. And what was nice, what kind of cool too is Darla had a, le the lesson she prepared was about, you know, having a recipe, and she even had a cookbook uh, that my mother had given her. So it all worked in really well. Anyway, so they needed judges. <laughs> yes. So ap after being a judge, you know, you, you had to sit at the table with a scorecard and have them bring cupcakes in front of you and present their themes and talk about the cupcakes and how the, the decorations. And then the judges, of course, had to do the taste tests. So because of that, Brother Mark and I deem this the greatest youth group event of all time. All right, let's, um, again, please bring your offerings up front and put them in the plates. Now let's pray, please. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus to thank you for all the blessings you have provided, for this opportunity to give back a portion of what you have blessed us with. And we know that they will be used for your work and for the blessings that you give and that you will receive all the glory. Please bless our tithes and offerings this morning as well as those who have been obedient in giving them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
All right, can I have the kids up for Sunday school so we can pray over our young ones? Please. I have to use my manners. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and thank you for these young brothers and sisters. We hold them up for you to minister to their hearts this morning and add to the foundation that has already been started building in their hearts. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will be with Sandra as she teaches from your word. And we ask that you open their hearts and minds to receive the message you have for them this morning. We ask for your protection over them always. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Pastor Lynn. Praise the Lord. Praise Hallelujah. The Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. You know, this guy keeps amazing me right here. Amen. Yeah. 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 He's gone through a warfare again. I mean, truly a warfare. And what's he do? He comes back to church. Amen. There's, me, there, there's people uh, a lot younger than you would never come back to church and say, I just don't feel good. Where would you go? Yeah. <laughs> I, my little finger hurts, and I just can't sit in church and listen to a dull preacher. <laughs> this guy goes through heart problems, all kinds of different tests you can think of, thinking he's almost on his way out, and he's on his way into church. Yeah. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. And I believe God is doing a work in these end times, not through just the youth, but through the elderly people too, because the elderly people have been kicked aside in this generation right now. And there's a lot of younger people that are seeing that and agreeing with it because they need the el older generation as well. They learn from the older generation. And the older generation, we get our encouragement from the youthfulness of the younger people coming in. And that's how we all fit together. But we want to thank the Lord for bringing Brother Larry back in with his wife Darlene this morning to be part of the fellowship and what God's doing. And since I already prayed for healing through the holding the Bibles up, I believe that manifestation is here. And I thank the Lord for the healing power and deliverance and whatever needs you have. But that is happening even while you sit here. And we are entering a time, and I'm going to say it again. We're entering a time in the world supernaturally where I believe we'll see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit throughout the world within churches and within our country, within our homes. We're going to see the manifestation of angels also. And, uh, and I'm, not, I'm not, when I say that, I'm always careful because I don't want people to get caught up on angels. Angels have a purpose. They're ministering spirits. They're not here to be glorified. They're, they're working. God sends them to do work on the behalf of us when we need them. But my biggest thing is always knowing that the Holy Spirit is present. And I'm looking for the Holy Spirit to move in each one of our lives in the days ahead. You watch in the, in the days and weeks and months ahead within the world. We're going to see miracles happen within the world. God's going to show himself, and not only that, that I believe God's people are going to have a special anointing to get off our thumbs and to go tell the world why you're seeing what you're seeing. Amen? I, I have a heart of expectation. I'm not dismayed at what's happening in the world. I'm excited because I see the Lord setting something up to glorify him. Amen? But we just want to thank the Lord for bringing... Oh, did you want to say something? No, I wanted to hog the whole time. No, just... Oh, go ahead. Let's... <laughs> we don't have a mic, do we? No, just go ahead. Last Sunday, I was laying in the bed in the nursing home. And uh, Jimmy Swagger message came on the TV. And uh, it was on reaching out and touching the Lord. And how that you don't give up on the Lord. You keep going back Amen. and back Amen. and back. 
because he's still there working for you. That's right. Yeah. And at times we have a tendency to give in. That's right. It seems like. Yeah. And it just encouraged me to think that, you know, he talked about the man that went to the door at night needing a loaf of yeah. bread. Yeah. And he came back and he came back and he came back. Amen. Till finally he gave it to him. Yeah. yeah. Amen. It's like the Schwann's delivery man. He, he just keeps coming back until you tell him, get lost. But I know what you mean. God's not going to tell you to get lost. No, because you're saved. But you know something, Larry? These people in here have been holding you up in prayer, Darlene. So just want to get that going there. But praise God. Hallelujah. And Brother Rick, I'll tell you what. I, uh, you were a judge. How many like a sermon that is exciting and just, oh, it's just what you want to hear. And boy, you're just pumped up and can't wait till that preacher starts preaching. And everything. How many like sermons like that? Huh? You get, only some of you do. Okay. Well, I tell you what, that's not going to be one of these sermons today. But it's going to be a sermon that's going to bring hopefully growth in our lives. That's what we need right now. With the soon return of our Lord, watching events happening in the world, we want to grow and become as much like Jesus as we can and forget about the popularity and about all the entertainment stuff. We need to grow in Christ. The church does. And with the Lord's help, I'm going to touch on something today that even I had a hard time preparing the message for. Because I always tell you, many times when I preach, I'm preaching to myself too. So today, I'm going to preach on big specks and little logs. Big specks and little logs. Brother Rick, you mentioned you wanted to be a judge. Well, this, you probably relate with this today somewhat. Not that I'm saying you're judging everybody, but just the fact you brought up the word judge, I thought you confirmed my, my message today. As long as there's cupcakes. <laughs> Amen, brother. Well, I'm like you. I really take the cake. And... and uh, <laughs> Praise the Lord. Don't get me going on that. Ruth will get mad at me. This. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But anyway, the, uh, the following passage of Scripture is most often quoted by those who do not follow Christ and are directed at that to those who do follow Christ. Hypocrisy is the number one sin in Christians that are accused of doing this. And, but I want to clarify, Christians do walk in hypocrisy. Amen? We're not clear, but, but anyway, the world is quick to point out hypocrisy in Christians' lives. My title today, Big Specks and Little Logs, the idea is that we tend to play up the sins of others while downplaying our own. I wore shoes today that won't get scuffed. <laughs> As I step on my feet. But I want to say up front, I know Christians that will accuse another Christian of judging, but overlook the fact that they are judging at the same time by judging the other person. Isn't that true? It's going to be quiet in here today, and I knew that, so, you know, I'll hear if your phone goes off. <laughs> Romans 14.10 But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We are not to judge one another. And this is important because we're in a time of the world where we have the political thing going on and people are judging one another from every side and making comments and putting people down. Hatred is flowing, differences, and all kinds of things are being judged in everybody's life right now. And it's truly getting right down sickening. Right? Matthew 7, chapter 7, verse 16. It says, ye shall know them by their fruits. See, God didn't call me to judge, but he called you and I to be fruit inspectors. That's what we do. But we don't judge people. 
Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? I want to know if somebody's doing that, and I want to know if they're in the church doing that also. That I have a right to look at their life and, and see, are they bringing hope and joy and grace and mercy to the body, or are they in here to bring division? So in a sense, we always have to make some kind of a judgment call, don't we? But we're not to judge people. We just need to be aware of that. I not long ago warned a person that I got uh, a conversation going with, and I was talking to somebody that was living in a sinful lifestyle. And I was telling that person, I hopefully pray in a loving manner that they need to get out of that lifestyle because it will damn their souls to hell. Because it's true, it is. Well, when I did that, somebody else got involved in the conversation that claims to be a Christian and told me that I am a poor excuse for a Christian and I ought to be ashamed of myself for judging that person. Well, for one thing, I didn't judge that person. I warned that person in a lifestyle that they were living in. I didn't judge them personally. So we need to be careful of doing that type of a thing. So anyway, my conversation went with this person. It turned from the one that I was warning to this person because I thought that was interesting. So I started asking, so they said they were a Christian and I was judging, so I started asking them questions out of the Bible and I got to the point, I said, tell me what being born again means, if you know what it means. I never heard a word from them. Because they, my guess, they weren't born again and they couldn't answer it. I don't know that, but they didn't want to answer that part of it. But we got to be careful not to judge people. My text for today is out of Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 6. It says, judge not. There you see, Rick, can you relate with this now? Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judge... Yours was a good judge, by the way. That was good, fun stuff. So you know what I'm saying. For with what, what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considers not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, then, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Boy, Jesus didn't mince any words there, did he? He told us straightforward. And I tell you, when I, when I was preparing this message today, I was going out a few times all the way through it. At the very heart of hypocrisy is the ability to spot a speck in another person's eye while being blind to the log that's in one's own eye. Amen? Yes. We do. I'm guilty of it. I'm standing here saying that I've been guilty of doing that and it isn't right. And I need to get it under the blood. I need to ask God to forgive me when I've done it. And hopefully I won't do it again, but if I do, I need to come before the Lord and ask for forgiveness and that it be put under the blood that I do not judge my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not right. Judgmental people are not pretty people. Are they? A judgmental person, when you see them, you can sometimes tell, I'm just saying, sometimes you can tell when they're judgmental. Not just here, but you can see. Jesus has something to say about the critical and judgmental eye. The first one, the critical eye, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, and I'll read it again. Judge not that ye be not judged... For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And here Jesus warns against condemning the actions and motives of others. Because sometimes we don't know or understand why somebody does or says something the way they are. And we need to be careful, but we're so quick to make a judgment of that person because we don't agree with it. And we need to be careful of that. 
Only the Lord has the right since he has, he's the only one that's got the full knowledge of the intent of the heart. He's the only one that can judge. We can't. On the other hand, he's commanded us to judge righteous judgment. John chapter 7, verse 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And then in John chapter 5, verse 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. And who is the Son? Jesus. Jesus is the judge. He's going to be at the judgment seat of Christ to judge the works of all Christians shortly right after the rapture of the church. And then he's going to be at the great white throne seat. Don't want to be at that one. Don't want to be at that one. See, we pass judgment when we say things like, he's crazy. Hmm? He's a deviant. Or he must be the product of a poor home environment. What kind of people could raise a child like that? We make judgments like that. I know that I've done that in the past where I've made a judgment call on somebody's life because out of appearance mostly, or maybe the way they talked or whatever, and I made a judgment. And then when I ended up talking and visiting with that person, I would go home and say, God, forgive me for what I thought and said about that person when they told me why they were acting the way they were and what was going on in their life. And they were hurting deeply inside, causing them to react the way they did. And I was making a judgment call toward them. And I had to ask God to forgive me. We don't know what's going on in each other's lives, even in here this morning, in the depth of a heart. Only God does. At one extreme, Jesus is commanding those who are his his followers to refrain from condemning others or passing judgment. And at others, at the very best, do not be quick to form opinions about others either. In other words, we neither, we shouldn't be condemning nor have critical attitudes of others, should we? See, Jesus said he, he didn't come into the world to condemn, did he? He came into the world to save. Why is that person the way they are? You know, I was watching, anybody ever watch that show, Hoarding? You know, I don't know, I, I watch it once in a while because I'm so amazed how somebody cannot see. But you know, yesterday I watched three different episodes of it and every person, when the person would start talking to them why they hoarded the way they do, is they had a deep hurt within their life. A tragic event happened within them that set them off to become what they are, and they, they were, were attracted to hoarding for a purpose and a reason to cover up the hurt that was given to them earlier in life. But how many people would judge and say, look at that old fool. Look at that, how stupid can you... I mean, common sense, you, you don't fill your house up with... But, you know, you can say that, but we don't understand the depth of the heart. And we need to lift that person up and say, God, help them. Help them. Whatever is hurting them inside that they need to surround themselves with filth and garbage. We need to pray for that person for deliverance. See, Jesus is not talking about judging in a courtroom. He's talking about being unkind and unloving and hasty and making judgments about others. Are you still with me this morning? I mean, this is important. This is important. Jesus is talking about being holier than thou. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about feeding the rumor mill where, when we don't know all the facts. I got to read this short story, and Rick Cullen, you're going to probably relate with this. There's a story about a man who had a manufacturing business. One day as he walked through the plant, he saw a young man leaning against the pallet of a packing crate doing nothing. The businessman approached him and angrily asked him how much money he made a week. The young man said, I clear about $300 a week. The businessman then pulled out his wallet, peeled out three $100 bills, handed them to the young man and said, here's a week's pay now, get out of here and never come back. The young man skedaddled. 
As the business owner asked the warehouse manager, how long has that guy been working in our plant? The manager replied, he doesn't work here. He was just delivering a package. <laughs> See, that kind of judging is called jumping to conclusions about the character of another person. And how many times have I know I've done it. There's a certain arrogance about self-righteous person also, which him or her think they have a right to pass judgment about and censure others without any sense of restraint. And you know, the longer we walk with the Lord, we need to be careful of that. Because it's something to be saved and born again where God has taken your sins away and you become righteous in him. And to think that we are so arrogant to look at somebody else and say, you're not like me. And we need to be careful. We, that's why I'm saying be grateful for your salvation. Thank the Lord. Because see, Jesus is the one who paid the price for my sin, your sin. And we need to, that's why we preach about it every Sunday. People say, hey, I get tired of hearing about Jesus dying. No, you should never get tired of that. For all eternity, we're going to be praising him and thanking him for dying on a cross, keeping us from going into an eternal hell. Because we were already judged to an eternal hell. And Jesus came. The prime biblical example is found in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. And he spake this parable unto a certain which, listen to this now, unto a certain which trusted in themselves that were righteous and despised of others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus, listen to this, with himself. With himself. God, I think that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Do you hear that? I fast twice in the week and I give tithes that all I possess. What a wonderful, wonderful Pharisee. That's what he thinks of himself. This Pharisee congratulated himself on his own self-righteousness. He was filled with sin of pride. The, perhaps the worst sin of all, because that was Satan's sin that got him out of heaven, was pride. But that's where that Pharisee was. He was looking at all the good things he's done. All the good things that I would ever do on this earth for Jesus Christ is but a stench in his nostrils. Why? Because Jesus is the only righteous one who's never sinned. And that's, I need to remind myself of that. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Who humbles him? We humble ourselves. When we get to a point where we think we are better than other people, we better humble ourselves. We better humble ourselves, even within the church. If we think we're better than somebody else within the church, another brother and sister, <clears throat> excuse me, had to swallow my spit. <laughs> then we need to be careful. We need to be real careful. On another occasion, when he was addressing the way of some self-righteousness Pharisees, he said in Matthew 23, 24, Ye blind guides would strain at a gnat, and you swallow a camel? In their efforts to avoid sin and guilt, they swallow the camel of judging others. The camel is being self-righteousness and having a critical spirit. Being a critical and judgmental person is to swallow a camel while fussing about little things. Amen? But when we are critical and judgmental toward others, we have set ourselves up to be judged by our own standards. 
two insights. Number one, Jesus said, treat others the way you want to be treated. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. So this is the law and the prophets. See, this is called the, the so-called golden rule. The golden rule conduct. And uh, I don't want somebody judging me on who they think I am, right? Somebody said, oh, that, that Lynn Deekman, you know, he's a big mouth. He's got a loud mouth, and he thinks he's really something, and, you know, and he's, he's just, he thinks he's funny, <laughs> you know. And they got all kinds of opinions and thoughts, and they're judging me on my character and everything and not even really knowing me. I don't want to be judged like that. Do you? then I shouldn't do it to anybody else. I need the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit. When my lips start talking about somebody, to the Holy Spirit, help me to shut my lips. Let's pray for that person. Amen? I'm not the only one now. I, I've already confessed, but I know I would see hands if I asked. I know I would, if not the whole crowd here. Because we're all in this thing together. We're all in the soup. You still going to hang with me till I finish? Yep. Amen. See, remember this also that it's not prerequisite for salvation. But to teach believers and given a standard by which we should seek to order our personal lives in front of others. Jesus said, others will judge you by your own level of harshness, and they will. Matthew 7, 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So don't be surprised if you judge people harshly, that all of a sudden somebody comes against you and judges you the same way. Because that's what the Word of God says. And guess what? God's Word is true. And it does come to pass, because it's a living Word. There's a certain arrogance or presumption that comes with a critical eye. There's a true story a pastor told of a man who was ever so rigid about the Christian life. He was known for being severe and being critical. On one occasion, he came to see the pastor and carefully laid out his shortcomings and those of the church family. At one point, a sudden discerning insight came over the pastor, and he stopped him and asked him if he had respect for the spirituality of any man or woman in the church. And he said he did not. So the pastor talked to him about the sins of spiritual pride and self-righteousness. He was not a happy man when he left the pastor's study. True story. And when you or I demand perfection of others, we had better be certain that there's no imperfection in us first. In fact, the critical eye is not only characterized by self-righteousness, it is also blind. And then we have the blind eye. How, how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of the speck in your eye when you can't see the, past the log that is in your own eye? Ouch, huh? Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. And why beholdest the mo the, thou mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considers not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. Ouch. Jesus tells us exactly the way it is. He doesn't mince words. We need to be oh so careful when we are judging our brothers and sisters in Christ. We may not think we're judging them when we say we, you're judging, but they are. They're judging. They're judging. And maybe we need to find out why would that person say something they're doing. That's when we come and reason together the way the Lord tells us to. We find out because many times, did you know that hurt people hurt people? Why is that person saying such hurtful things? Maybe we need to go and have a 
conversation and find out why this person said what they said about you or me or whatever and come together and pray together and let the Holy Spirit bring healing. Isn't that how the church is supposed to work? That's how it's supposed to work. That's, you know, we serve such an awesome Jesus. Because see, if Jesus was in here, he wouldn't look across all you folks here and he wouldn't be thinking things He'd be thinking all things. The Bible tells me he thinks of you of things that are good and true and honest. He doesn't come condemning. He doesn't come judging. And we need to be examples of Jesus. Once a man who had been married for nearly 50 years was concerned for his wife, so he went to the, see the doctor. He told the doctor, I think my wife's deaf. She never hears me when I speak to her. In fact, sometimes I have to repeat myself several times before she hears me when I, what I can do. Well, the doctor said, go home and stand about 15 feet behind her and ask her a question. If she doesn't reply, move five feet closer and say it again. Just keep doing this, moving closer and closer so we can determine the severity of her deafness. So he went home, and when he had walked into the kitchen, his wife was chopping vegetables. So he asked, what's for dinner? He got no response, so he moved closer and asked, what's for dinner? Still no response, so he moved closer and closer until he was just behind her when he asked again, honey, what's for dinner? Exasperated, his wife turned around and said, for the fourth time, it's vegetable stew. (laughs) It's being a bit of humor about being presumptuous about who has the problem. Right? I think it's really neat that the Holy Spirit speaks to us, don't you, through his word. And and when I find myself getting critical about somebody, even within my family, that I I want the Holy Spirit to say, shut up. Because it's damaging myself, and it's hurting the other person. And I want, I want, when we say we want God to do everything within our life to meet our needs, to, to bring the joys and the happiness and the things in our life, I want to be able to do it with a heart that is clean. Two insights in that verse 3 and 5 that I read about beholding the moat. You may indeed discern a problem in the life of another person. But before you try to give guidance to another person about their faults, you need to discern and deal with what's wrong in your own life first. And this is not to say that there is no place for loving intervening in someone's life when they are running off the rails. That's what we're supposed to do, help people to get back on track in their life. Paul wrote in Galatians, Galatians 6, 1, he said, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You know, I've known Christians in the past have accused somebody of sexual sin, and they ended up in the same way that person did. We can't judge somebody when they've fallen off the rails. We've got to go and restore them in meekness and humility. And not go around blabbing and tearing them down and hurting them. But we're to reach out as, as Jesus would. And show them and find out why they got off the track. And we need to help them get back. Big amen? amen. Hallelujah. So before we get judgmental about the life of another person and decide to to help a person see the error of their way, we need to be very, very certain that we don't have some imperfection of our own. Because I'll tell you what, the devil will come along and he will bring temptation that you never dreamt would come into your life in the very same area where you're going to be off the rail. Don't ever think you just arrived. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stands take heed lest he fall. So when I'm prepared to make a judgment about someone, I better be very careful lest I end up the same way. 
But then it seems Jesus throws us a curve or a caveat. It feels like we are not to go about being all critical and judgmental toward others. But then Jesus says there may be exceptions. The discerning eye. The discerning eye. Don't waste what is holy on the dogs. People, that meaning talking about people are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample your pearls and then they'll turn and attack you. Don't walk into a crowd of unholy people unless the Holy Spirit tells you to do it and start preaching the word of God to them. They'll tear you apart. I did that one time. More than once. I, I, I stopped in a Jehovah's Witness parking lot one time when they just dismissed and I got the whole crowd. I thought, I'm a, I want to try this once, Lord. And man, they came, all surrounded me like you would not believe it. And you know how loud, I had to scream so loud so they could hear me. Because they were all coming at me. But I knew it was the wrong thing to do. I, wasn't, I was achieving nothing. I was throw, casting the pearl before a swine. Matthew 7, 6 again, Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. See, it is counterproductive to try to teach the treasures of biblical truths to those who reject or ridicule the Scripture. It does. The Holy Spirit needs to prepare their hearts to receive the Word of God, and then we can share it with them. While it is imperative that we not be critical of others while blind to ourselves, there is a time for discerning things in a life. We look at somebody. If you thought the energy of picking out a speck out of, of sawdust in someone else's eye and while having a log in your own eye is vivid, consider this, Jesus instructs us. He says, give not that which is holy unto dogs. Or in other words, neither cast your pearls before the swine. There are all kinds of idioms about pigs, right? You can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. You can't put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. <laughs> These days, putting lipstick on a pig is usually in regards to political spin, isn't it? Politicians try to make something sound and listen. They try to make things sound and look good, but beneath all the superficial stuff, it is still a pig of an idea. Like the current Equality Act that they are trying to pass right now. I polled this because I think it is vitally important because it's going to affect every one of us in this room. And we need to be aware of it. The Equality Act. They, put, they present it that it is this wonderful thing to treat everybody evenly and fairly. And, ooh, you know, a man's a man, a woman's a woman, a woman's a, a woman, a man, you know. Women can go into men's bathrooms and... They can do whatever they want. I don't want, I don't want no man going into my, my wife's bathroom when I take her out to the Target store or wherever. That's right. Amen. That's right. yeah. Yeah. But that's what that includes. Listen. During the debate yesterday over the Equality Act, a measure that would create a right to kill babies in abortions and force Americans to fund abortions, Republicans accused Democrats of ignoring biblical values. And a surprising comment from a pro-abortion Democrat congressman, Jerry Nadler, confirmed that to be true. Part of the debate over the pro-abortion measure result, revolved around sex and gender issues, and Representative Greg Stubbe uh, of Florida upset Democrats when he confirmed God makes boys and God makes girls unique. Amen. Would you amen that? Amen. I would. When men or women claim to be able to choose their own sex identity, they are making a statement that God did not know what he was doing when he created them, the congressman said. The gender confusion that exists in our culture today is a clear rejection of God's good design. Whenever a nation's laws no longer reflect the standards of God, that nation is in rebellion against him and will invitably bear the consequence. That's where we're at today. The congressman said, we are seeing the consequences of rejecting God here in our country today. Yeah. 
That promoted a rather shocking comment from Jerry Nadler. And here's what he said. What any religious tradition describes as God's will is no concern of this Congress, he admitted. We're in trouble. I'm making a judgment call here. He's wrong. He's wrong. And I pray that God will save his soul. Because if God doesn't, that man, Jerry Nadler, will go and live in an eternal hell for all eternity because he doesn't care what God thinks. He's not concerned. None of the new Congress is. That's where they're coming out with the Equality Act, which has already gone through the House on the way to the Senate. We've got to pray that God intercedes because it will stop preachers from preaching in pulpits. We won't be able to preach against homosexuality, according to the Word of God, not to condemn homosexuals, but to warn them. We will be stopped. We won't be able to preach on sin. We won't be able to do anything that is any negative consequence. And that's what that Equality Act, that's what the enemy, Satan, is coming after, is the church. We need to pray for these leaders, even if we disagree with them wholeheartedly. we got to say, you know, my prayer is get them right or get them out. Yes. I'd rather have them saved and born again, kneeling at the cross, and the blood of Jesus cleanse them all, and we all go to heaven together. But Lord, if you can see already they're going to destroy the human lives by the multitudes, the millions around the world, then get them out. They're evil. Amen. They're led by the Satan himself. Jesus does not say we are never to admonish another person. He doesn't say that. He just says that we are to make sure we have no hint of self-righteousness about us, no hypocrisy in our own lives before we do any admonishing. And some people, like the pig, will not appreciate your concern for them. Your words of admonishment, your spiritual counsel, sharing of the word of God, or your desire to help them. Jesus says we would be wise to discern who will appreciate your concern and who will not. And if they will not, we need to keep our mouths shut. Two more insights. I'm almost done. Number one, some people, like a pig pen with pearls, will not appreciate your concern for their faults. When we tell people we're concerned about their faults. No, some people, number two, like pigs who do not get what they want, will become angry and they will attack you. Yeah. Amen? Sure. They will. Yeah. In fact, there's something of a principle found in Matthew chapter 10, 14, where Jesus instructs the disciples, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Get out of there. Yeah. You can't force Christianity on anyone. You can't force anyone to give their life to Jesus. You know, I, we have family members in our own families that I, I want to get born again. And they, are, they can be the most aggravating people in the world, right? Because we know them. They're like us. But I want them born again. But I can't force it on them. And I've told them enough, so you know what I do now for those people? Not just them, but friends, people uh, that I know that I worked with and everything. I just pray for them. I let the Holy Spirit do the work to soften their hearts, and maybe he'll send somebody else, or maybe later on they'll call me up. And that's happened, hasn't it? They call me up. They say, I want to be saved. If they reject you, don't judge them. Don't tear them apart. Just say, Lord, touch them. Touch them. Touch them. Speak to their heart. I want them saved. Hell is not going to be pretty. We don't want anybody to go there. There is something to discerning if a person is receptive or unreceptive before expressing. You can, many times I can discern if a person is ready to receive what I have to tell them or ask them or speak with them about and when they're not or when they are. I know when their hearts have already been primed by the Holy Spirit, and I know that I can just go forward. I've done that a, about two or three times already with doctors in the past couple months. 
Their hearts were already primed. I knew that I could just walk right in there and share the gospel with them. In fact, I just did it with a banker. I prayed with him because I knew his heart was primed to receive what I had to say. And he was willing to share with me about a problem he had. And I said, well, then we're going to pray. In conclusion, as we go into this new week, we will come face to face with people all too human. They will be slow, right? They say, they will say irresponsible things to us. The devil will make sure he'll test you. They will sit too long at the stoplight. Huh? They will wait on till their groceries. When they sit at that stoplight, you moron, step on it. <laughs> you idiot. We're making judgment calls. We're making judgment calls. They will wait until their groceries have been rung up and bagged before they think about digging out their wallet. <laughs> oh, Lord, what a stupid person. They will cut you off. They will say hurtful things to you. They will forget to deliver your paper. They will return your call. They won't return your calls. They will follow up your order. They will forget an appointment. They may mess up in the, in the parenting realm. They will gossip about you. They will break a confidence. They will take advantage of you. They may do things that give you cause to raise your eyebrows. They will persist in self-destructive habits. They may even send a condemning self-righteous glance your way. That's what we're going to face this week. To all of that and more, Jesus says, don't judge. Don't judge. So when you feel a good, righteous indignation coming on, remember 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 and 7. Let's all stand, please. Listen. Charity, meaning love. Charity suffereth long and is kind. It suffers long, it's kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemingly, seeking not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Wow. I don't know about you, but I got convicted just preaching this message this morning. I really did. Because I'm guilty. How many else would say with Pastor, I'm guilty with you. I'm standing right next to you. See, God knows already, doesn't he? He already knows us. That's why I wanted to touch on this, because in the time we're living in, we're so close with all the anger and hate in the world right now, it's easy. And we need to become more like Jesus more than ever because he's coming back. But first, I just want to mention, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and there are none righteous. There's, there's not a single person in the world that is righteous before God, not one. And Jesus says the wages of sin is death. That means separation from a holy God for all eternity. Think about that. For all eternity, you will be separated from a holy God in our sin. And we're all born into sin. All of us. Nobody's exempt. I've heard people say, well, I hope I'm, I'm good enough to get to heaven. You won't be. You'll go to hell. Hell's going to be full of good people. But you can't get to heaven being good. You only get to heaven if you had Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. With every head bowed this morning, I want to ask right now, is there anyone in here and say, Pastor... If I died right now, I don't know if I would go to heaven. If you say you don't know if you would go, then you're a candidate to say, I need Jesus right now. Just lift up your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to embarrass you. God sees those hands. I'm going to do one more thing. This is the hardest thing. I'm just going to ask you to come and stand right in front of facing me. And we are going to pray with the whole congregation here. 
Everybody Jesus called, he called publicly. He said, if you're ashamed of me before man, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father which is in heaven. If you're in here this morning, I'm not going to force you, but I'm just going to ask you to come forward and stand with me, and we're going to pray prayer. That's all we're going to do. God saw your hands. And if, you don't, if you're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of you. He said it. I didn't. And he does that for a reason. I want to explain that. The reason God always calls people publicly because it's easy just to lift your hand in a crowd and put it back down and go back into the world and live the way you are. But many times when you come forward, you're showing the people within the church. I gave my life to Jesus. Now you've got accountability. So if you're sincere, I'm going to count to three and then I'm going to pray and we're going forward. Number one, God wants you to come. Number two, he really wants you to come. Number three, Jesus is praying that you come. That's why he came to earth, not to condemn. You might go out this afternoon, you may be killed, you may drop dead. I know teenagers that drop dead. I know teenagers get killed. I know teenagers get diseases and die. You don't have to be old to die. I would encourage you, come, come. I want to give it. I believe that God, Holy Spirit wants you to come. I believe it. Come on, come on. Praise the Lord. We all had to do this, didn't we? Everybody, everybody that Jesus calls, he calls us. That's why I have people come forward. It's not to embarrass anyone. But this is the Holy Spirit. This is the most important part of the service right here. We're going to have all these people. We're going to pray together. And I'm going to pray a prayer, and I'm going to have you pray with me, okay? Now, the prayer doesn't save you. It's if you believe what you're saying and you receive it and you live it. That's what saves you, not the words. It's really putting your trust in what you're saying to the Lord, okay? So we're going to pray. And everybody else, you're going to pray with me, right? Yes. Heavenly Father, pray it out loud, though. Come on, pray it out. Just open your mouth and let the Lord know you care. Heavenly Father, yes. we come to you in Jesus' name. In Lord Jesus I ask you to forgive me. I am a sinner in need of salvation. And Lord Jesus, from the day I was born to where I stand here this morning, I ask for forgiveness for all my sins. And Lord, I ask you that the precious blood of Jesus wash those sins away and Lord you said you would throw them into the sea of forgetfulness never to remember them again and I receive right now Lord your gift your forgiveness and Lord Jesus I believe you came to earth I believe you died and I believe you rose again and I believe you're coming back again. And Jesus, I ask you right now that you come and live within me through your Holy Spirit. You said, Lord, that you would live within me and I would become born again because now I have your Spirit within me. And Jesus, right now, I thank you I praise you for saving my soul. And with your help, Lord, I want to live my life for you. And I repent of any of my sins. And with your help, Lord, will not go back to them. With your help, Lord. And I thank you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. Young ladies, the Lord heard these prayers. 
He heard you. And you know what happens when you give your life to Jesus? What's your name? Cece. I'm sorry? Cece. Cece? Gabby. Gabby? Donna. Donna? Your names are in heaven right now. The Bible says that the angels are dancing around the throne of God, rejoicing because they're sitting there saying, they gave their hearts to you, Lord Jesus. That's what the blood of Jesus does. Amen? So, you're my sisters in Christ. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about that. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And we receive you and love you. And we'll be praying for you that God will help you through those times in your life. Amen? Every one of you. Lord bless. And, and please let me just say this quickly. I won't hold you any longer. Read your Bibles daily if you can, even if it's a chapter. Start in something easy. Don't start in, in uh, Leviticus. <laughs> Go to the book of John. That's a good book to start in. It's easy to understand. And, and make sure you pray every day and just say, Lord, help me today. And then fellowship. Come to church when you can, whether it's this church or another church. That's your business. But go to a Bible-preaching church. When you do those things, you will begin to grow because I want to warn you. If you and I do not do that, the Bible says Satan will come along and steal what God has given and done today. He will come and he will rob that away from you if you don't do anything with it. And he loves you so much. And we love you. So praise the Lord. And glory to God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now I want to do one more thing, and then I'll finish out the service again. I want to ask everybody that says with me, because, see, I need the Lord to help me not to be judgmental and critical. Raise your hand. You say, Lord, I need that help today. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, you see a needy people. You see a people that has the tendency to always want to judge or to be critical of others. But, Lord, we... come before you, Lord, and we lift ourselves before your throne right now as the body of Christ. We ask that the Holy Spirit this week and the days should Jesus tarry even after that, every time we have a tendency to want to tear someone down or even someone that's hurt us, Lord, help us not to be judgmental, but Lord, help us to go to you and say, Jesus, touch that person. Do a work in their, per- in their life, but do it in mine also, Father. Help me not to be judgmental and critical that I can be like Jesus. Because see, when you, Lord, sent Jesus to earth, he didn't come looking around judging and criticizing. He was looking around and saying, who will follow me? Who will say, who will accept my grace and my mercy and my salvation? Who will do that? And that was his heart and still is today. So, Lord, we surrender this time to you and trust you going forward in Jesus' name. We pray and everybody said, amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Look at somebody and say, I love you no matter what you think of me.